Yeah. In my video yesterday, I discussed at some length the events that pointed to a tumultuous, indeed in some ways a very frightening day, with Russian announcements of military exercises which included tactical drills on the use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons, and with the Russians calling in to the Russian Foreign Ministry, the ambassadors of Britain and France for what looked like a severe dressing down. And I explained that the trigger to these Russian moves appeared to be two articles written by Stephen, Bra uh, Stephen Bryan, which have appeared in Asia Times. One article from late April discussing the deployment in Ukraine of so-called advisors sent to Ukraine by the United States and NATO. And Stephen Bryan very plausibly, and I'm sure correctly, says that many of these so-called advisors are actually special forces who are expected to assume some kind of combat role. And an even more astonishing article that came out a few days later from Stephen Bryan, in which Stephen Bryan said, that units of the French Foreign Legion had already been deployed to Ukraine and had taken positions close to the front line in Slavyansk and that more troops from the French Foreign Legion were following. And I mentioned how over the course of yesterday, um, the uh, Putin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, so that the Russians were taking immediate steps to discover whether these French Foreign Legion deployments had indeed taken place. And obviously we had all of the other steps that the Russians took over the next few hours. Well, in the hours after my, I did my video, but in some cases before the video was published, a lot, for, a lot more event, events happened. And it is clear that there was a major backing down over the course of yesterday by the Western powers, and I suspect also a sense of bruising humiliation as well. Things uh, turned out rather more forcefully than I think some of the Western powers had expected and the result is that um, the Russians, to a great extent, have not only um, not only humiliated the West, the Western powers, and um, re-established, reaffirmed their red lines, but have now given a clear indication that they are prepared to enf enforce them. Well. What did happen? Firstly, a lot of things started to happen as soon as news began to appear that the British um, and French ambassadors had been called in for a meeting at the Russian Foreign Ministry. Firstly, the Italian government, and to be more, more specific, the Italian Defence Ministry, which has been extremely unhappy about all the talk about NATO military deployments in Ukraine, and has made it known for some time that it strongly disagrees with all this talk, well, the Italian Defence Ministry started to publish one statement after another. Firstly, they made it absolutely clear again that they had no intention of deploying troops in Ukraine. This is not part of their plan, and that is not going to change, or so we understand. Secondly, they then went further, and the Italian defence minister himself apparently acknowledged that the sanctions against Russia were not working. He apparently said, I haven't seen the exact quotes, but he apparently said that the Western powers had over had over um, um, estimated the extent of their global influence, that there is no prospect of a military victory in Ukraine, and that the priority must now be to sit down with the Russians and to agree to some form 
of negotiation with them. That started to come from Italy. Then Poland also weighed in. The Polish government um, issued another statement that there are no Polish troops in Ukraine and no plans to send any. That, by the way, is almost certainly untrue. At least the first part of it is. There are Polish troops in Ukraine. There have been Polish troops in Ukraine for a long time now. Some of them undoubtedly have been in action against the Russians. A Polish general, according to reliable reports, was recently killed close to Chasov Yar. It should be said the Poles themselves say he died of natural causes, but I don't know anybody who takes that claim seriously. So there are Polish troops in Ukraine. But of course, these troops work on an undercover basis as essentially volunteers or mercenaries, or so we are repeatedly told. And then the French government began to make a whole succession of statements. The French ambassador, uh, Mr. Pierre Lévy, after he left the foreign ministry, he made no comment to the reporters, but he said but his government then started to make a whole succession of rather interesting statements. Firstly, they said that there are no French Foreign Legion troops in Ukraine. So they are denying Stephen Bryan's story. Now, Stephen Bryan's story has been circulating for some days. The French government has not denied it up to this point. It took a call, a summons to the Russian Foreign Ministry and Russian nuclear drills before the French finally said that there are no French Foreign Legion troops in Ukraine. Now, again, I don't take this entirely seriously. I suspect that there are French Foreign Legion troops in Ukraine, but I suspect what is going to happen again is that the numbers of troops who are going to be sent will be scaled down, and we will again revert to the pretense that the troops who are actually there are merely volunteers or mercenaries operating outside the structure of the French Defence Ministry and that they're not officially there as soldiers. Anyway, President Macron himself then apparently said that France is not at war with Russia or with the Russian people. We then had further statements from France that France recognises President Putin's legitimacy as Russia's president that the French ambassador would attend the in ceremony in which President Putin is inaugurated as president of Russia. That would make France the only major Western country to send its ambassador to attend that ceremony, which is a major um, concession, by the way, clearly an attempt at some level, to appease Russian wrath. And um, overall, the whole picture suggests, again, a major French retreat. Though, importantly, the French have not said that they have no plans to send troops to Ukraine. Obviously, and presumably, given Macron's Many comments to the contrary, making such an assertion would invite ridicule. The British, as of this time, have said absolutely nothing. But then the White House also began to weigh in. The White House, first of all, said that all of those comments about sending troops to Ukraine, this is clearly a uh, reference to Mr. Jeffries's comments of yes reported yesterday on um, 60 Minutes, the, the CBS 60 Minutes interview. Anyway, all those comments about the United States sending troops to Ukraine are wrong. There is no plan or intention to send US troops to Ukraine. That might be true for the moment, but anyway, that's what they said. And the United States went further and 
said shortly after that the United States recognizes President Putin as the legitimate president of Russia. And shortly after, early today in fact, I saw a report which said that the US ambassador in Russia is now traveling to the United States, presumably for urgent consultations with the US government, and perhaps, quite plausibly, carrying a message from the Kremlin. <laughs> As I said, so far the British have said nothing. And we have the Russians providing us with an explanation of why the British ambassador was called in, because the British have been most reluctant to discuss this. So this is the statement that has appeared from the Russian foreign ministry about the summons to the British ambassador. On May 6th, UK ambassador to Russia, Nigel Casey, was summoned to the foreign ministry to be delivered a strong protest against the recent statement by British Foreign Secretary David Cameron in an interview with Reuters regarding Ukraine's right to strike Russian territory using British weapons. The ministry firmly pointed out to Ambassador Casey that Cameron's hostile outburst directly contradicts the British side's earlier assurances during the transfer of long-range cruise missiles to the Kiev regime that they would under no circumstances be used to strike Russia's territory. By doing so, the head of the Foreign Office disavowed this position and admitted his country was de facto a party to the conflict. The ambassador was told that the Russian side considered Cameron's words as evidence of a serious escalation and confirmation of London's growing involvement in combat actions on Kiev's side. Nigel Casey was warned that any UK military facilities and equipment on Ukrainian territory and beyond could be hit as a response to Ukrainian strikes on Russian territory with British weapons. The ambassador was urged to consider the inevitable disastrous repercussions of such hostile steps by London and to urgently refute in the strongest and un most unequivocal manner the bellicose provocative statements by the head of the Foreign Office. Now, we're not, of course, told what Ambassador Casey actually said in response to the Russians, but, as I said, there's been radio silence about this exchange in London. In fact, when I say radio silence, I literally mean that, because if you go to the British media, if you went to the British media yesterday or today, you would find barely a reference to these events. You would hardly know that the Russians were conducting nuclear weapons drills and had called in the, Ru the British ambassador and had issued a strong protest and had made clear threats to take retaliatory action against British territory if Russian territory is attacked with British missiles. Now that is actually extraordinary. You would have thought that given that we are in that situation, this would be the lead story in the British media. I'm going to suggest that an instruction must have come from the British government or from the British authorities to the media that there should be no discussion of this topic at all. The only article which I have seen to discuss these events in the British media at any in-depth level was one which appeared in The Guardian, which most unusually was an entirely factual account of the summons of the British ambassador to the foreign ministry and to the fact of the nuclear drills. It even 
mentioned the fact that the Russians had complained about provocative statements made by London, and it even quoted some of the words used by Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov. We are still, as of the time of making this video, waiting to see if there's going to be any actual words from the British government, but frankly, that seems extremely unlikely. But we have had one clue about the nature of the discussion that may be taking place in London at the present time, which is an article has appeared in The Independent, an important mainstream newspaper in Britain, um, a broadsheet, which is to say a newspaper different from a tabloid in that it covers news uh, uh, um, you know, in a more in-depth way. But perhaps, and you know, this is said with apologies to people on The Independent, perhaps slightly less of an establishment newspaper than some of the others. It calls itself The Independent, after all. And beyond that, um, because it's much the newest of the British broadsheets, it has perhaps less international weight than some of the longer and older um, newspapers like the Guardian, the Financial Times, the Times and the Telegraph. So it's a nice way of publishing an article, discussing something without drawing too much international attention to it. And this article discusses the Crimean Bridge and it says that based on satellite imagery, um, the Crimean Bridge is no longer being used by the Russian military for logistics purposes. Only one train um, with um, what might be considered military use equipment, fuel to be precise, was seen to cross the bridge in March. And the, since the bridge has ceased to have any real role in Russia's logistic efforts, there might be perhaps less point in attacking and seeking to destroy it. Well, that looks to me like either a hint that the British, after this major warning from Moscow, which for all I know might have included warnings about an attack on the Crimean Bridge, after that the British have now decided that they do not want to risk potential retaliation from Russia by letting Ukraine use storm shadow missiles, which the Germans have helpfully informed us um, require um, assistance, targeting assist assistance from, Brit from the British to attack the Crimean Bridge. And the, the story that's being spread is that, you know, since the uh, bridge no longer serves any military purpose, why attack it? Of course, we've known for quite a while now that the bridge doesn't actually have a military purpose, that the Russians send their military supplies across the land bridge from Russia to Crimea that the Russians established in 2022, that the Crimean Bridge has lost its importance as a logistical route. Anyway, it's a nice, convenient way of saying, well, you know, because it no longer has that logistical role, it's no longer a target, so let's drop the idea of trying to attack it. It means that you are pretending that it's because the bridge has lost its utility that you are not attacking it, not because you've been warned by the Russians of consequences if you did attack it, and you don't want to have those consequences possible. Russian attacks on British territory and on British military assets around the world, you don't want, that to, inv you don't want to invite that upon yourself. Anyway, 
this is obviously myself reading things into this article in the independent i don't know the whole story but anyway the fact that the british are saying as little as they can about this affair shows how profoundly embarrassed they are it also shows how angry the russians were with david cameron's comments about the ukrainians being at liberty to use british weapons to strike at any position they wished in Russia. And it also shows that the Russians have again reaffirmed a warning that Putin gave some time ago. I recall that he actually said publicly that if long range missiles are used to strike at Russian territory, and obviously he means pre-2014 Russian territory, though that might include, by the way, the Crimean Bridge, which is partly, as a fact people always forget, linked to Krasnodar uh, territory, which is, of course, also part of 2014 Russia. But anyway, Putin clearly said that if there were missile strikes of that nature on Russian territory, countries in the West, which facilitated those missile attacks, needed to understand that the Russians also possess long-range missiles and could use them in retaliation. So that's what passed between the British and the Russians. But we also have an account from the Russians of what they said to the French ambassador. And it's a slightly shorter readout, and it reads as follows. Due to the French leadership's increasingly bellicose statements and incoming information about France's growing involvement in the conflict around Ukraine, and that's a clear hint of the French Foreign Legion deployments, which, by the way, I personally treat this readout as partly confirming. On May 6th, French ambassador to Russia, Pierre Lévy, was summoned to the foreign ministry. Russia, the Russian side gave its fundamental assessments of Paris's destructive and provocative line, leading to further escalation of the conflict. It was emphasized that the attempts of the French authorities to create some strategic uncertainty for Russia with their irresponsible statements about a possible dispatch of Western military contingents to Ukraine are doomed to failure. The goals and objectives of the special military operation will be achieved. Now, yesterday, after my video was published, a commentator, one of the viewers, published what I thought was a really um, intelligent and insightful comment. This person, I have no idea who this person is, by the way, said that the Western powers basically forgot that the Russians do not do strategic ambigu ambiguity. And here we have the Russian foreign ministry telling us as much. It was emphasized that the attempts of the French authorities to create some strategic uncertainty for Russia with their irresponsible statements about a possible dispatch of Western military contingents to Ukraine are doomed to failure. The goals and objectives of the special military operation will be achieved. In fact, to the extent that this has indeed been an exercise in creating so-called strategic ambiguity, it has catastrophically backfired. It has caused the Russians to reaffirm their red lines and their um, intention to go after any Western troops that um, engage in combat operations in Ukraine. It has led the Russians also to make clear that in what they consider an existential conflict 
they're prepared to go all the way up to and including the use of nuclear weapons if they have to. And it has also caused the Russians once again to restate their resolve, the goals and objectives of the special military operation will be achieved. As that commentator on the thread of my video said, the Russians do not do strategic ambiguity. Uh, whatever Macron and the others thought they were doing, it has blown up spectacularly in their faces. And with Xi Jinping in Paris, one can imagine the pressures on Macron yesterday. And that's also no doubt why we've had one olive branch coming in Paris, waving, waved towards the Russians, one after the other. No French Foreign Legion troops in Ukraine, France not at war with Russia or with the Russian people, Putin the legitimate president of Russia, France not seeking regime change there, and last but not least, this really remarkable decision to take to, to instruct the French ambassador to attend Putin's inauguration. So, in summary, a brutal humiliation for the Western powers. Um, I would, I, I would be been very interested to listen in to some of the discussions which were certainly taking place over the course of yesterday between Western capitals. Um, the phone lines between Washington, Paris, London, Brussels, and of course Berlin, would have been chattering continuously. It's a fair guess, guess that a blame game and bitter recriminations have been taking place. The Italian government has gone out of its way to dissociate itself entirely from the entire affair. It's all, always made clear its strong disagreement with this whole agenda that Macron has been following. And I cannot help but think that one of the reasons why the French have gone to the lengths they have to essentially apologize to the Russians, or at least to convey to the Russians their regret for what has happened, even if apology is something they can't, at this particular time, bring themselves to do. I can't help but think that this is partly a reflection of the fact that over the last couple of days, but specifically also yesterday, some of the Western leaders rounded personally on President Macron. He has been blamed by everybody for having created this crisis, which is basically what yesterday was, and this humiliation for the West. Now, let me make a few further points here. The Russians, contrary to what many people say, do not bluff. When they do genuinely establish red lines, they adhere to them. Now, we've heard many times from many people say that the West has been able to cross Russian red lines repeatedly over the course of the conflict in Ukraine, and the Russians have never really objected. Uh, this has always concerned military equipment deliveries um, deliveries of tanks, armoured vehicles, um, guns, missiles, that kind of thing. For the record, I cannot recall a single instance in which any Russian official has said that the delivery to Ukraine by the West of any particular weapon system was for Russia a red line. I would stress when I say any particular weapon system, I mean any particular conventional weapon system. The Russians 
have never said, for example, that they would treat delivery of attack missiles and storm shadow missiles to Ukraine as red lines. But the Russians have nonetheless acted to establish red lines. They made it very clear, for example, that any thought of sending nuclear weapons to Ukraine is completely out of the question, that they will come down very hard on anything like that. And um, not coincidentally, yesterday, the Russians issued a further statement reminding everyone that F-16s, which are due to be delivered to Ukraine shortly, if they're not, haven't been delivered already, are dual-use aircraft. They're capable of um, launching both conventional and nuclear weapons. The Russians have said that they will treat the F-16s as nuclear-capable delivery systems, and that means that they will hunt and destroy them, and since they are dual capable, they will hunt and destroy them, even if they operate from Romania and Poland, from bases in Romania and Poland. The mere fact that they are operating outside, from outside Ukrainian territory, from within NATO territory, will not deter the Russians from chasing and destroying them and attacking the bases in Poland and Romania um, in which they will be based and from which they will operate. So that is clearly one Russian red line. And the other Russian red line is about strikes on Russian territory, pre-2014 Russian territory. The Russians have quietly accepted that all post-2014 Russian territory, including Crimea, and Donbass, even though legally speaking, as far as the Russians are concerned, um, these are Russian. Anyway, for the purpose of this war, they are contested territory. And as part of the conflict zone, the Russians seem to accept that if there are attacks on these territories using long-range missiles supplied by the West, the Russians won't object too strongly. But if long-range missiles supplied by the West and partially operated by Western technicians, as we know the Storm Shadows and the Attackums and the Taurus missiles, if they ever arrived, strike at Russia, the Russians again will treat that as a crossing of a red line. And they have said, and they've said again unambiguously, that they are prepared, in that case, to respond in kind against the countries that have supplied these missiles and which have participated in their launch. And whilst, so far as I know, the Russians have never explicitly said that the deployment of Western troops in Ukraine is a red line, they have gone out of their way repeatedly and they have reaffirmed again that if NATO troops in any form are introduced into Ukraine, as far as Russia is concerned, these are combat troops participating in the conflict. The Russians will hunt them down and fight them, and in many cases kill or wound them. And of course, by definition, if the Russians are fighting French and British troops in Ukraine, then, as Dmitry Medvedev hinted in the statement he issued yesterday, there would be little logic in the Russians holding back and not fighting British and French troops also out of area in various places around the world. So, a major reassertion by the Russians of their red lines and a cave in by the Western powers. A deeply humiliating moment. And one, and that's the reason, by the way, why you're he hearing so little about it. In fact, almost nothing about it in the media in the West today or, of course, yesterday. By the way, 
and for the record, this is not the first time this has happened. I remember that back in October 2016, uh, the, shortly after the Russians had intervened in the Syrian conflict, there was some talk in the United States about um, launching missile strikes against the Syrian military, um, which was at that time involved in a tough battle with um, Syrian insurgent fighters um, in and around the northern S Syrian city of Aleppo. And there were US military deployments that seemed to be indicating a potential missile strike against the Syrian troops. And the Russians rushed sophisticated air defense missiles to Syria and gave a warning that if the United States did try and launch missiles, the Russians reserved the right to shoot them down. And I remember that a few hours later, a statement came from President Obama, or rather from his press office, his, his uh, press secretary, press spokesman, saying that the president was not looking for a confrontation and in fact calling the whole idea of that missile strike off. And again, as I remember, the media in the West failed to mention what had happened, even though we'd had a direct confrontation of face-off between two nuclear superpowers, though we did subsequently get sort of confirmation of the incident from no less a person than James Clapper, Obama's Director of National Intelligence, in evidence he gave to Congress. So there we are. Um, this sort of thing does happen. It's happened before. Yesterday it happened on a huge scale. It was, as I said, in some respects, a very frightening day. And it bewilders me that the media in the West is not reporting the story or giving it the degree of attention that it obviously deserves, with the result that the Western public overwhelmingly does not understand how serious the situation yesterday became. Now, does this mean <laughs> that we are not going to see attacks on the Crimean Bridge, that French troops will not be sent openly and officially to Ukraine, that the United States, contrary to what Stephen Bryan said, will never send troops to Ukraine, even after... Uh, the November election is underway. Well, I wish I could say all of that, but unfortunately I can't. Um, it seems more likely to me that this massive rebuff from the Russians, though it might have alarmed and frightened some people in Western capitals, as by the way it should, uh, will be seen by others as a challenge and as a provocation. And it's entirely plausible that at some point over the next few weeks and months, and especially after the election, if President Biden wins, we will see further and greater and more insistent demands for a renewed, new renewed strikes against Russian targets deep inside Russia and for... Uh, the deployment of Western troops to Ukraine. But anyway, for the moment, and it may be a very short time, it looks as, th as if all of this has been called off. There is still a chance, a real possibility, of an attack on the Crimean Bridge. Some kind of attack on Ukraine did take place yesterday, um, but it seems to have been of a fairly low level of intensity. The Russians seem to have brushed it off. Um, I, I appreciate that the military summary channel is making 
rather grandiose claims about what happened, that the siege of Crimea is apparently underway. But I have to admit, I didn't see any sign of that myself. So it could be, as I said, that further plans to attack the Crimean Bridge and to do all of that have been called off for the moment. But given the realities in the West, I don't believe that this is a settled decision. And it's quite plausible, quite possible, that the decision will be reversed before very long. I'm going to just add one further point, which is that, of course, both the United States and Britain are going to have elections fairly soon. In the United States, the election is in November. We don't yet know the exact date or even, or even the general date of the British election, only that it must happen at some point over the next 10 months. And I would have thought that both the US and the British government would not want an uncontrolled escalation of the conflict in, with Russia and a situation where, in the case of Britain, British territory was attacked and British servicemen were killed on the eve of an election. Given how unpopular I expect British involvement in any war to be, and I suspect that in the case of the United States, where the unpopularity of the forever wars is even greater, I'm even more sure that the United States would not want to, be, to find itself in any kind of conflict situation with Russia before November. But once the November election is out of the way, and once the British election is out of the way, and in the case of the British election, it's important to remember that the Conservative government and the Labour opposition have almost identical policies. In fact, they have identical policies on the conflict in Ukraine. Once the conflict is, once the election is out of the way, the political imperative to keep things quiet before the election will have gone. And it is possible that all sorts of very bad and very dangerous ideas might take hold again. But in the meantime, at the price of some humiliation and embarrassment for the Western powers, the agenda of troop deployments to Ukraine, missile strikes on Crimea, all that kind of thing, that seems to have been called off. Anyway, there we are. That's where we stand today. Now, today is the day of President Putin's inauguration. In fact, he is being inaugurated as President of Russia, even as I speak. I have not obviously had the opportunity so far to uh, read the speech he is going to deliver. Apparently, President Putin has written the speech himself. He's not speaking this time through a speechwriter. So, anyway, we'll see what he says. I will no doubt discuss that tomorrow. Um, what I will say is that the mood in Russia is upbeat and um, optimistic. The economy is booming. There's an industrial surge underway. Living standards have been rising. There's a renewed sense of confidence um, about economic prospects and, I suspect, astonishment and perhaps pride that the country has absorbed the sanctions blow so successfully. The Russians are confident in their various partnerships and alliances. Uh, China, which Putin is due to visit in a few weeks, um, has remained a firm partner. So has India, where Prime Minister Modi looks certain to be re-elected. And, of course, the special military operation continues.
and continues from a Russian point of view to go well. Now, it's more difficult for me today to describe what has been happening on the Ukrainian battlefields because obviously yesterday's news to some extent obscured um, the events from the battlefields and today all the Russian military reporters and by the way many Ukrainian ones are more focused on the events surrounding President Putin's inauguration. But I will say a few things. Firstly, it's clear that the battle for Krasnogorovka is continuing. There are reports this morning that the Russians have made more, more advances inside the town. They now hold the high-rise buildings in the industrial district, um, in the centre of the town. This is from the film of Krasnogorovka that I have seen. A rather scattered, um, decentralised community. It's not a closely built-up area in the way that Vuglidar, Vuglidar, by comparison, is. So it's a rather spread out place, um, but nonetheless, the Russians appear to be uh, advancing in various parts of it. And I saw a report early this morning in Sl from Slavyangrad that the Russians are continuing to push their forces. Um, now, um, are, are bombing the Ukrainians are on advancing and gaining more control of more territory within Krasnogorovka itself. Um, Sirsky, the Ukrainian um, military commander, um, is saying that the next Russian objectives after Krasnogorovka will be Kurakovo and Pakrovsk, he may be right. I think Kurakovo certainly he is right. I think the Russians do most certainly want to capture Kurakovo because as far as they're concerned, that opens the way to cutting the supply routes to Vuglidar. And I get the sense that Vuglidar emphatically is a major Russian priority. But about Pakrovsk, biggish city, to the uh, west of Ocheretino, about 50,000 people, as I understand it, before the war. About Pakrovsk, I, conf I confess, I am less sure. It's not at all clear what the Russians really plan with respect to that place. But the Russians confirmed, um, I think it was yesterday, the capture of Solovyova, uh, this village to the uh, southwest of Ocheretino. In fact, we've known that they've controlled Solovyova for some time. And there are, there's a multitude of reports that the Russians have now pushed southwestwards from Solovyova towards Novoprokovsky, another village which the Russians are seeking to capture. And the idea is that the Russians, if they can capture this village, um, will then move on and attack from the north east the even more important village of Novoselivka Persia, which the Russians are also simultaneously are, are simultaneously attacking from the east, from Berdichi and Semenovka. So the Russians are pushing hard in those places too, uh, in, in, uh, towards, those, towards this place too. And there's also lots of news, lots of reports that the Russians have now reached and in fact have broken into the uh, village of Novo Alexandrovka, northwest of Ocheretino, that they've broken into this village and that there's fighting going on for control of this village of Novo Alexandrovka and that they are also advancing towards the town, the village, or rather the small town of Kalinova, north east of Ocherentino, with 
an, uh, an attack on Kalinovo from two directions, from Ocheretino and from Novo Kalinovo. Well, lots of fighting, in other words, going on around Ocheretino. Uh, entirely unsurprising. The battle in this area has it obviously remains intense. And for the record, I think that this is still very much the area where the Russians are continuing their major offensive and will continue their major offensive over the next few weeks. And there are reports that the Russians are also planning an advance along the H-20 highway, um, which lies to the east of Novo Kalinov and Krasnogorovka. A couple of videos ago, I said that a village called Novo Bakhmutivka, which lies to the east of the H-20 highway, and which should not be confused with the other village of Novo Bakhmutivka, which lies immediately to the south of Ocheretino, which the Russians captured about two weeks ago. Anyway, I said that I thought it likely that the Russians would seek to capture this village of Novo Bakhmutivka, the one which lies east of the H-20 highway. But it's been pointed out to me that the Russians actually have controlled this village. They captured it a long time ago and it is securely under their control. But it is likely that the Russians will advance along the H-20 highway and northward from Novo Bakhmutivka, and that they will seek to capture the other three villages that lie in a line to the east of the H-20 highway and north of Novo Bakhmutivka, uh, which are to say Ale Alexandropil, Pantele Pantelimonivka and Suche Balka. And if this happens, then Ukrainian concentrations around the small village of New York will be in effect, will in effect face encirclement. And there will also be an operational crisis for the Ukrainian troops still further north in the town of Toretsk which the Ukrainians occupy and from which they have been trying to launch attacks on the Donetsk city of Gorlovka, which has been under Russian control since 2014. So the fighting remains very intense along the Ocheretino front lines. I have no reason to think that the tempo of operations is going to slacken or reduce in any way simply because Putin is being inaugurated or because the Russians celebrate um, Victory Day on the 9th of May. The fighting remains extremely intense and the Russians working hard to exploit the breakthrough which they have now achieved. And I haven't spoken about Chasif Yar. Um, again, there has been relatively few reports coming out from Chasif Yar. I suspect this is again more a reflection of the fact that most of the reporters are discussing Putin's inauguration, but also, no doubt, the fact that the Russian Defence Ministry has tightened reporting around the fighting in Chasif Yar. But I understand that the major focus of Russian work around Chasif Yar is that the Russians are continuing to expand the territory that they control to the south of Chasif Yar along the, um, along the um, Chasif Yar Canal, uh, sometimes referred to, by the way, as the Seversky Donetsk Canal. Um, Maybe to avoid confusion, I will soon start referring to it by that name also. So an intense battles again happening there with Russian bombing of Ukrainian positions in Chasifya taking place on an round the clock and 
relentless scale. And last but not least, a most enigmatic battle taking place further north in the Kupiansk area. The Russians uh, first broke into the village of Kislovka. Um, then before capturing Kislovka, they launched a secondary attack against another nearby village called Kotlerovka. They captured Kotlerovka very quickly. Kislovka then fell. The Russian Defense Ministry yesterday confirmed that it is fully under Russian control. It's now being suggested that the Russians are thinking of launching further attacks towards another village in this area called, I believe, Ivanka. And one way or the other, it looks as if the Russians are preparing to outflank Kupiansk from the south. It's never easy to work out what the Russians pla Russian plans are. It's, I think, always folly to try to second-guess the planning and thinking of the Russian general staff. They are very good at keeping their secrets to themselves, but all the indications are that there is the Russian offensive is still under the, underway, and it continues to gain ground. And the Russians have, of course, communicated to the West that the mere talk of deployment of Western troops to Ukraine is not going to stop them or slow them down or, by the way, make them rush. They're going to continue to conduct operations at the same pace that they always have, and they remain confident of eventual victory. So there we are, a rather, um, a rather um, interesting day yesterday, more, as I said, reports on the battlefronts today. We're going to, we'll have to wait and see what the Ukrainians do, if they do indeed decide, despite certain indications from the London, London to the contrary, that um, they do decide to um, launch, uh, uh, the Ukrainians do decide to launch an attack on the Crimean Bridge. We'll have to see how that uh, plays out, if it does happen. But anyway, I think that the Russians, very confident at the moment, and I think that given the Russians are in such a confident mood, with the war going their way, with the economy going well, with Putin looking unchallenged in his leadership of Russia, if we did see an attempt over the last 10, or 10 days or so, to shake the confidence of the Russian leadership, to create strategic ambiguity and all that. And I think the timing for that was spectacularly ill-judged. It's probably always a bad idea to feed uncertainties about its security to the leaders of a nuclear superpower, just saying. But if you are going to do that, then do it at a time when they're nervous and unsure, not when they're feeling confident. The Russians are feeling very, very confident. And that is why, when the moment came, they had no hesitation in calling the West's bluff. Now, the conflict in Ukraine, in my opinion, remains the central one in global affairs, but it is not the only event that is taking place in the world. Um, the Israeli military has now begun its offensive against Rafa. And again, there's been reports of heavy fighting in Rafa. Uh, the U Israelis have obviously had little difficulty capturing the crossing into Egypt. 
um, and raising the Israeli flag there, by the way, which some might see as a provocation, but never mind. Um, I can't see how this is going to solve any of Israel's problems. It's, despite what the Israelis say, unlikely, I think, to lead to the collapse or destruction of Hamas. I don't think this is achievable. And besides all that it is doing is emphasizing the extent of Israel's inability to destroy Hamas up to this point. And if Hamas survives this attack, then again it will emerge even stronger. Hamas, for its, its part, has now shown again that it has a much keener understanding of the politics of this conflict than the Israeli government has. Because Hamas yesterday, on the eve of the attack on Rafah, presented a ceasefire proposal. This called for a swap of prisoners for hostages. Now, of course, this has been Hamas's demand all along, but they repackaged it and published it yesterday. And they called again, ultimately, for a permanent ceasefire. And they made certain concessions from positions that they've taken previously in putting forward this proposal. They did so because they knew in advance that the Israelis would reject the proposal. And that the Israelis would reject the proposal was made completely clear by Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, about a week ago when he insisted that the offensive against Rafa would take place regardless of whether the hostages were released or not. This is very characteristic of the way in which the Israeli government is behaving. It's basically sticking two fingers up at pretty much the entire world, including many people in the United States. I have to say that I think that this is reckless and arrogant and extremely unwise and disastrously counterproductive from a political point of view. I read many angry commentaries from uh, various people who are sympathetic to Israel about how the crimes of Hamas have been forgotten and about the fact that it is Israel that gets criticised. Well, this sort of behaviour um, almost invites, well, actually does invite that sort of criticism. It, it, it shows an astonishing tone deafness to what most people and the vast majority of world governments ultimately think. Now, there is one government, which is, of course, the exception, and that is the Biden administration, which, again, has carried out its complex and tiresome dance, um, which it has been following ever since the events of the 7th of October. Now, this can be described as follows. Um, advising the Israelis to exercise restraint and making it sure that everybody in the United States through the media is informed of this. Um, ringing, much hand-wringing or parent hand-wringing hand when the Israelis say they will not exercise restraint. When the Israelis then launch an attack, which up to this time all of these attacks 
have proved politically counterproductive and unsuccessful. Comments that seek to dissociate the United States from these attacks. And then, of course, the United States, despite all of this, these statements and comments and appearances of disapproval, nonetheless reverts to its old habit of giving unconditional support to Israel and in many cases to supplying Israel with weapons. Now, <laughs> I don't know whether the administration understands how much damage this tactic is doing. It gives many people around the world the impression that the United States is being duplicitous, that it is stringing the world along, that it's pretending to disapprove of Israeli actions, that it's making token statements about stopping arms deliveries to Ukraine, even as in reality it steps up those arms deliveries, and that it's basically trying to fool people into thinking that the United States is taking the situation seriously when it is actually doing nothing of the sort. And the one thing I have always found that people don't like and are most unwilling to forgive is when it appears to them that they're being strung along. It's undignified and it's humiliating. And there's supposed to be another General Assembly vote coming up soon to decide whether or not the General Assembly will support Palestine's bid to be made a full state, to be granted full voting rights status in the United Nations as a state, as a sovereign state. Um, and I expect that vote to be massively in favour, despite apparently the United States using every form and means of pressure at its disposal to prevent too many countries from voting to support this move. But there it is. It's, as I said, the classic behaviour of this administration. I think it's causing increasing anger within the United States itself, from both sides, by the way, of the political divide. The supporters of Israel are angry because the administration is not giving Israel full unequivocal support. The critics of Israel are furious because the United States, the administration, seems to be giving Israel unconditional support. So it's perhaps an electoral strategy, but it is not a correct strategy to follow. Of all that talk of a few days ago, about two weeks ago, about the United States trying to engineer the removal of Prime Minister Netanyahu from office, of that we hear nothing more. Apparently, the United States instead now is looking at engineering the removal of someone else. That person is, of course, President Zelensky of Ukraine. There were reports appearing yesterday. Um, I think it was in Slavyansk, but they've been in other places too, that the United States is has now finally lost patience with President Zelensky. They see him as erratic, eccentric, um, um, unable to make stable decisions, all of which is true, by the way. Um, and they want him replaced by someone that they think is more um, manageable than Zelensky has proved to be. And the names, the three names that crop up are former President Poroshenko, 
Kiev Mayor Vitaly Klitschko and the former Ukrainian military leader Valery Zaluzhny. And supposedly the intention is that when Zelensky's term ends on the 21st of May, he is in some form persuaded to stand down and one of these people, in some way, which I don't understand how it can be justified constitutionally, one of these three people formally takes over. And the idea, I suppose, is that this person will provide a more stable and uh, appropriate command of the war. There's no suggestion that this person, whoever he is, should seek peace with Russia, by the way, that is absolutely excluded. But he should conduct the war in a more um, stable way. And the Ukrainian people will support this person with relief. Relieved to see in the back of Zelensky at last. And things on the battlefield from that moment on will only get better. Now, these operations to remove leaders whenever they become awkward for the United States, in my opinion, never solve anything. They make problems, existing problems, worse. In the case of South Vietnam, which I've discussed many times, which is, has some striking parallels to the situation today, the coup against President Diem was botched and he was actually murdered over the course of it, and his removal destroyed the credibility and legitimacy of the South Vietnamese government, which was never recovered, and the South Vietnamese army became demoralised and showed increasing unwillingness to fight. And I suspect much the same will happen if such a regime change operation is conducted in Ukraine. But let's look at the three people that the United States is thinking of placing in Zelensky's place if these rumours are true. Zeluzny, I think, generally doesn't want the job. He's made it fairly clear, I think, on many occasions that he doesn't want to be president. He understands, I think, how impossible the situation would be. Poroshenko former president, most certainly does want to be president. Um, however, he is deeply unpopular. In fact, when he was president, he became so unpopular that the Ukrainians, in an overwhelming majority, voted for Zelensky instead. It hardly seems like a good plan to reinstall in the presidential office someone the Ukrainian people have already rejected. And the third candidate, Vitaly Klitschko, is precisely the person that Victoria Nuland and Jeffrey Pyatt, at that time the US's ambassador to Ukraine during the Maidan crisis, ruled out as the leader of Ukraine. They thought that he was too willful and eccentric and ultimately to control. So that's the problem there. At least, however, with Ukraine, the United States does apparently have some people it thinks it could put in President Zelensky's place. In the case of Israel, I have absolutely no idea who they think would convincingly lead an Israeli government at this time in place of Prime Minister Netanyahu. If Netanyahu is ousted in order to pave the way for a more pro-American Prime Minister, I think this will only create a deep political crisis in Israel and will almost certainly backfire. But Anyway, we'll see what the United States does and what happens. Now, I said that there are other things going on in the world. One other thing is the presidency, Xi Jinping, is now 
on his tour of Europe. He had a meeting yesterday with Macron. Um, the indications are that he did not go particularly well. I understand Ursula von der Leyen from the EU Commission um, was also there. Uh, the Europeans, Macron and Ursula, tried to get Xi Jinping to agree to cut off economic links to Russia, a hopeless, a hopeless idea. Um, and they tried to um, get Xi Jinping to agree to reduce exports to Europe, which also seems to me uh, a hopeless idea. Um, Global Times has an article about what happened, which strikes me as showing signs of loss of belief on the Chinese side that the Europeans can ever be sought, be expected to see sense. Um, and I mean, it makes claims like this. It says that China and France should, should uphold mutual benefits jointly oppose acts of decoupling and disrupting industrial and supply chains and say no together to building barriers. That's from Xi Jinping. China and France should uphold, should uphold independence and jointly fend off a new Cold War or block confrontation. But notice the word should. Now, it may be that the Chinese um, wording is different and the there is some different meaning um, to the word than the word should has in English. But for what it's worth, it's there, and it's in a Chinese translation. And it looks as if the Chinese are far from confident, confident that what they think should happen actually will happen. So... There we go. It seems to me as if the Chinese are losing hope both of Europe and of France and of Emmanuel Macron. Elsewhere, Xi Jinping has attended in Belgrade the ceremonies to commemorate the attack on the Chinese embassy by the NATO powers during the 1999 operation against Yugoslavia. Uh, the timing is, of course, significant. It happened 25 years ago. But why bring this topic up now? Well, again, I can't help but feel that it conveys to the Chinese people the sense that the Western powers then and now remain hostile to China. And... Xi Jinping then intends to move on to Budapest to meet with Viktor Orban of Hungary, something which the Europeans are hardly likely to welcome. So the rupture is taking place. The Chinese also would have seen something else. They would have seen how taking the toughest possible line with the Western powers, with the Europeans, with the Americans also, as the Russians have done over the last 36 hours, pays dividends. When the Western powers are given the kind of very clear warnings that the Russians gave to the West yesterday, they back off. It's difficult to think that the Chinese won't learn that lesson and won't apply it themselves to the various problem areas they have with the United States and the Western powers over Taiwan and in the Pacific and elsewhere. Well, there we are. A momentous day yesterday. Uh, we're still... Picking up the pieces today, as I said, I suspect there's an enormous amount of recrimination going on in European capitals.
and I suspect that Macron is at the receiving end of much of it. But there we are, a most important day. Um, we'll see what happens tomorrow and how things shape up and whether the, um, the hints from London that the idea of an attack on the Crimean Bridge has been called off, whether those hints have any reality. But in the meantime, all that remains is for me to wish you again a good day, to remind you that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribe Star, links under this video. Don't forget also to check out our shop. You'll find all sorts of amazing things there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.